Today what we're going over is how to check the refrigerant charge of an R410A air conditioner using our quick reference charging cards. So we have these available over at our website at acservicetech.com and these can be used for checking the charge and for troubleshooting. Also make sure to check out our refrigerant charging and service procedures for air conditioning book. So we have our book right here, the total superheat method, TXV effectiveness, the subcooling method, and so this whole chapter is on checking the refrigerant charge. But make sure you check out the full outline over at acservicetech.com. And now we're going to get started. Before turning the outdoor unit on, we're going to follow our steps right here. And we're going to take an initial temperature reading outside. And we are at 83 degrees. So now let's head inside. So the first thing that we want to do is determine what metering device is in the indoor unit. So we're going to remove this cover plate. So I've already taken most of the screws out. We're just going to take this last screw out. Now, sometimes it'll say it on the rating plate, but you want to confirm. And in this case, you see it's a piston. So this piston is a fixed orifice. And so we're going to be using the total superheat method in order to check the refrigerant charge. If we had a thermostatic expansion valve here with the bulb connected here and the external equalizer connected on the suction line, we will be using the subcooling method. So you just got to remove this plate just in order to see what metering device is on here. We're going to go ahead and put that cover plate back on. So now that we determine what metering device is in this indoor unit, just so you know, this unit is installed in a basement and we have our ducts overhead. So we want to follow our initial step one, which is to check our indoor temperature. And as well, our outdoor temperature, we want to make sure that they're both above 70 degrees before we check the refrigerant charge. And so you see that this is reading 72 degrees in here. And we also have checked and replaced our filter. So our air filter at the indoor unit. Now we're going to move on to step three here. So step two is the filter. Step three is we're going to pull the outdoor disconnect. And then we're going to turn the thermostat on in air conditioning mode. We're going to check the airflow. I'm out at the outdoor electrical disconnect and I'm going to go ahead and pull this and I'm not going to put it back in until I'm outside with the gauges on the unit in order to listen and to watch while that unit turns on. And now we're going to turn the temperature down pretty low just to make sure that it doesn't shut off on us and we're going to check the indoor unit airflow while the outdoor unit is off. Now that our indoor unit is running in air conditioning mode, we're gonna check our airflow speed. And so you know, we have a two ton outdoor air conditioning system. You need about 400 CFMs for every ton. So we're looking for about 800 CFMs crossing this indoor coil. To measure the airflow, you can either use the temporized formula if you have electric strip heaters in your air handler, or you can use your total external static pressure and compare it to the manufacturer's literature, or you can use a hot wire anemometer. In this case, we're gonna measure with our hot wire anemometer. We're measuring 751 CFM, so that's very close to the 800 CFMs required. Now we're going to go to the outdoor unit and connect our gauges. I'm going to first tape my temp sensors onto these lines with some electrical tape, and you could use the clamp-on versions. Whatever, whatever you have would be fine as long as your temp meter is calibrated correctly. So you can install quick connect test gauges like this or wireless probes. Our red gauge always gets connected to the small liquid line. That's the high pressure side. Our vapor gauge is always connected to the large vapor line and that's the low pressure side. So right now we're at step five, which is connecting the refrigerant gauges. And then next we're going to let the system run for about three minutes. And we want to make sure that the low side is above 32 degrees saturated temperature. So that's where we're going to go next. So we need to wait for about three minutes now. Right now we're measuring T1 on our liquid line and T2, which is right here, is measuring our vapor line. And so we have our outer ring is pressure, and this is an r 4 10 unit, and so we're looking for the pink inner ring. So we take an outer pressure and we convert that to the saturated temperature for r 4 10 on the inner ring, and right now, depending on how this camera angle looks, but it's about 32 degrees as a saturated temperature on the low pressure side. So we want to give it a little bit of time, you can see it's actually falling down below. Anytime that the indoor coil is below freezing, it's going to attract the humidity uh, crossing the indoor coil. It's going to freeze that humidity onto that indoor evaporator coil. So that would be a problem. So that's really what we're looking for right now during this initial three minutes of runtime. We want to make sure that that vapor sat temps above 32 degrees over here. So total superheat method is checked over here on the low side gauge, but we also still monitor 
the subcooling over here. And so if you take this pressure on this outer ring, which is about, say, 285, and we bring that into the inner ring, and it's still moving because it's just the initial runtime. We bring it in, and it's about 93 degrees saturated temperature in the middle of this outdoor coil. So we take 93 minus 92, and we can see that our subcooling is very low. So subcooling is the saturated temperature here minus the line temperature here. And so that a lot of times is around 10, 14 degrees of subcooling. But remember, this system has a fixed orifice, so we're mainly just checking over here. The fact that we have a low subcooling, though, likely that we're undercharged. So um, you may have this low pressure uh, gauge over here, maybe around freezing, but after three minutes, it should be up to around, say, 40 degrees saturated temperature. It may be 34 degrees, it may be 50 degrees, depending on the indoor heat load, but in this case, you see it's actually not moving. It's staying right at about, uh, right about 30 to 31 degrees saturated temperature. That's not good. Now, T2, we're measuring our line temp, and we're measuring 70, about 71 degrees. 71, minus 33 and we're left with a superheat of 38 degrees so we know that that is very high so this is the total superheat because we're at the outdoor unit and just so you know just because you have humidity uh, condensing on the low pressure side uh, surface port that doesn't mean that the charge is correct so a lot of people just go by that oh the, the line is cold it's sweating that doesn't mean that the system's accurately charged. It doesn't mean that you have good airflow. So you really want to check your airflow before checking the charge. And so now, right now, it's been about three minutes. And you can see our sat temp is a little low. So we must be uh, low on refrigerant. So now what we want to do is we want to wait about 10 to 15 minutes before checking the refrigerant charge with the total superheat method, which is the temperature on this line minus the saturated temperature over here on the pink inner ring because this is R4 tonight. We need to wait for about 10 to 15 minutes. I would suggest waiting 15 minutes. If you see that this uh, needle is just going down and you know it's uh, maybe 50 psi or 75 psi or something like that, there is a problem at that point in time and so you could use some of our other reference cards in order to find out what that issue is. Either it's low indoor airflow, a liquid line restriction, or the unit is very low on refrigerant. But as long as it stays above 32 degrees and you can give it your 15 minutes in order to have the refrigerant circulate through the system and kind of stabilize as the system's running, then we can go ahead and accurately check the charge. I'm going to go ahead and wait our 15 minutes now. This unit's been running for about 15 minutes and our vapor line temperature is pretty high. It's 73 degrees. But you still see that the line is sweating due to the high humidity outside. But anyway, we take our pressure, we convert it to our R4 tonight saturated temperature, and you see that we have about 37 degrees as an R4 tonight saturated temperature. So what we do is we take 73 minus 37, and we're left with a total superheat of 36 degrees. So 36 degrees, and we have nothing to compare that to yet. We need to find what our target superheat is. And to do that, we measure our indoor wet bulb temperature. We've got our digital psychrometer mounted in the return duct very close to our evaporator coil. Our evaporator coil is right here, and so the airflow is coming this way. And so we're measuring a indoor wet bulb temperature of 62 degrees. So our indoor wet bulb temperature was 62, and now we need to find what our outdoor dry bulb temperature is. And so you can see it's about 85, and so you take 85 over until where it lines up with 62 degrees as the indoor wet bulb temperature. So we're looking for a target superheat of 8 degrees, but we have a very high total superheat at 36 degrees. So as we go, this temperature will fluctuate a little bit, this sat temp will fluctuate a little bit, but we'll still have roughly the same total superheat. But anyway, we measured our total superheat, we found what our target superheat needs to be, and then we compare our actual total superheat to our target. And in this case, our actual total superheat is much higher than our target superheat, so that means we need to add refrigerant. I also want to tell you another, another quick tip on knowing that this system is very, very much undercharged, is our liquid line temperature is almost about 92 degrees. 
if we were to take our pressure on our high side and convert it, we have about 93 degrees as a sat temp. 93 minus 92 equals a subcooling of one degree. So this unit barely has subcooled liquid exiting this outdoor unit. That means we're low on refrigerant, especially when we have low subcooling, we have high superheat, we are low on refrigerant. So this subcooling should be much higher than that. So anyway, uh, we do need to add refrigerant. Before we go ahead and do that into the low side right here, we want to search for refrigerant leak. So we want to know why are we low on refrigerant in the first place. If you're extremely low the, and you add refrigerant in here again, it could just leak right back out again. So we want to search for refrigerant leaks on this system. So if you want to learn more about checking the refrigerant charge and troubleshooting, make sure you check out our quick reference cards. We've got our, our checking the charge with a TXV, our troubleshooting uh, parameters right here, our PT chart. So we have that, as well as our refrigerant charging and service procedures for air conditioning book. We have all this available over at our website at acservicetech.com. We also have our book, workbook, and quick reference cards available on Amazon. So make sure you check out the reviews there. Make sure you check out the full outline over at acservicetech.com slash acbook. And hope you enjoyed yourself. We'll see you next time at AC Service Tech Channel.